Ještě jednou dobrý večer. Jsem ráda, že jste sem přišli. Vítám vás na další části programu Inspiračního fóra v rámci Mezinárodního festivalu dokumentárních filmů v Hlavě. A budu mít za chvilku velkou čest vám představit americkou teoretickou fyzičku a hlavně astrobioložku Sáru Aymery Volker, která si pro vás připravila přednášku, v níž se bude věnovat hypotézám o vzniku života a možnostech života ve vesmíru. Tomuto tématu pozemskému a možná i mimozemského života se budeme z velké části držet i během našeho rozhovoru. Já jsem Lenka Vrtišková Nejsklebová, jsem redaktorka Deníku N, věnuju se rozhovorům a popularizaci vědy. A myslím, že můžeme, já nevím, jestli Sára je připravená, abych vám představila Sáru. Dobrý den, ahoj Sáro, hezký večer. <laughs> Slyšíme se? Yes, I can. Tak dobrý den, ještě jednou dovolte, abych vám představila americkou fyzičku a astrobioložku Sáru Aymery Volker, která si připravila asi 20-minutovou přednášku. Chci říct, že mě tohle nadálku baví, pro, pro, pro obě z nás je to myslím poprvé s překladem a takhle nadálku živý rozhovor, takže případně omluvte nějaké nedokonalosti, které se během toho můžou udát. Ale vlastně mě to baví, protože mám pocit, že Sára je možná někde v raketě, někde na orbitu, nebo možná ještě někde mnohem dál, Sáro. Ale ve skutečnosti jste kde? I'm in Arizona. Tak tam je aspoň vesmírné středisko. Like outer space. <laughs> A dovedla byste si to představit? Líbilo by se vám to? Um, I think I'd like to go to space at some point. It would be fun. Uh... <laughs> You know, with a, pro a proper environment in space would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> tak myslíte, že až budete ve vesmíru, tak spolu taky uděláme na dálku nějaký rozhovor? I think that would be a great idea. <laughs> Dobře, tak jo, tak já za chvilku předám slovo Sáře, jak jsem říkala, její 20-minutová přednáška, na kterou navážeme rozhovorem. A trochu to uvedu. Existuje život někde jinde ve vesmíru a jakou by mohlo mít podobu? A co když jsme se už s mimozemským životem někdy potkali, ale nepoznali jsme ho? Astrobioložka a fyzička Sára Emery Volker život chápe jako vesmírný kreativní proces, v jeho šádru leží informace, Sáro, je to vaše. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I, I do actually think the translation is kind of fun because it makes me feel not just like I'm in space, but a little bit alien. So maybe it's appropriate to the talk. Um, so, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I wanted to start by uh, talking about, uh, you know, the big question about alien life is we really want to know whether we're alone in the universe. And of course, when we think about the possibilities for life, um, we think about how big space is. Um, this is a picture of the Hubble Deep Field. So each point of light in this photograph is a galaxy. So there's thousands of galaxies in this one photograph. Um, and of course, when we look out at the night sky, that is just representing a tiny point in our night sky. So uh, we think that there's probably billions of galaxies out there and each galaxy has billions of stars and each of those stars most likely has planets. So it seems that likely we're not alone in the universe because there's billions of possibilities. And of course, we know this because we have advanced our understanding of cosmology so well. So when we're looking at these distant galaxies, we're actually looking into the past of our universe. So our telescopes, as they look deeper and deeper in time, are seeing more and more relics of the early universe. So we've learned a lot about our universe and our place in the universe as this very vast expanse of possibilities, um, but we don't know if there's any other life out there. And in fact, um, the only planet we know of that has life is our own Earth. Um, which is obviously a very special world. So even in that vast set of possibilities, uh, so far we know of one planet with life. Um, so most people will want to make arguments that life surely should be out there in the universe, given all the possibility, all the possible locations it could exist. Um, but I think since we only know one example of life, we really can't assume that we must 
not be alone in the universe? We actually don't know the answer to that question. And part of the reason that we don't know the answer to the question is because we actually don't know what life is um, and we don't know how to look for it. And so without having a confirmation about how easy or hard it is for a planet like our own or any other planet to give rise to life, uh, we can't really say with any certainty whether we're alone or not. It could be that those billions of possibilities are not enough because it takes trillions of tries. Um, so I'm really interested in understanding what life is and also how we can understand the origin of life process itself. How does life arise in the first place? So we really can think more critically um, about what are the possibilities for life in, in, in the universe and, and how we might think about the places where we could look for it. Um, so this question, are we alone? Um, I think is really the critical question we want to ask when we're asking about alien life. But we first have to ask a, a sort of more critical question, which is what are we? What are we actually looking for? Um, and um, and part of that question is just what is the fundamental nature of life? We obviously you know recognize that we're life um, and that we're surrounded by life on this planet. But so far we haven't seen um, that feature. We haven't seen life anywhere else. Um, and so we really need to ask real basic questions about what the nature of that is and what life is. Um, and so I've been really interested in the question of what is life most of my career because I think about alien life and I think about origins of life. How does life start in the universe to begin with? And I think both those questions really require us asking um, about the fundamental nature of life and what it is. And so there's a long tradition of people asking this question. Um, one of the most famous is the physicist Erwin Schrodinger, who's famous for his contributions to quantum mechanics, but he also gave a series of lectures in 1943 at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Study on the topic, What is Life?, which became a very famous book. It inspired Watson and Crick to look for the structure of DNA um, among generations of other individuals that were inspired by this work. And in that book, he was really asking the question about, could we explain life with the principles of physics and chemistry? So trying to think about life not as a biological phenomenon, Phenomena, but as a general phenomenon in our universe. And many people have asked this question over many generations. Astrobiologists are very interested in the question of what is life and usually take the approach of trying to define it. And so I really love this example uh, from Carl Sagan where he lists the sort of qualities we associate to life. So you might think of life as being things that reproduce or things that eat um, or, um, you know, uh, require energy to maintain themselves. And so these kind of definitions are ones that you might find in an introductory biology textbook. But Carl Sagan, uh, you know, was quick to point out that those kind of definitions are so broad that they, they apply to things we might not consider to be life. So for example, the definition that he provided, he argued could also apply to automobiles or cars. Um, and so, you know, nowadays we've even sent cars to space. There's a very famous example of Elon Musk sending his red Tesla into space. Um, and so, um, you know, you might really further think that cars are an example of life. Um, and so Carl Sagan used this to sort of argue that it's really hard to build a definition of life. And his part of his point was that any such definition might apply to, to machines if we wanted to use these kind of mechanical definitions. Um, and so this is sort of a general challenge uh, with defining life, that if you want to put a boundary on the phenomena you call life and actually try to put it in a box and define it, you always have things outside of that box that you might want to include in it and things that are in it that you really want to put outside of it. So it's not a clean category. Um, and so for Car Carl Sagan, you know, he could he didn't want to include machines. I actually think technology is as much a manifestation of life as biology is. So I disagree on that point. But we always have cases like viruses as another counterpoint. They're very hard to fit in traditional definitions of life. Um, and, and things like fire also sometimes fit definitions of life, but we don't feel intuitively like that would be a good definition. And so um, the approach I've taken is really not to think about defining life, but to look for deeper principles that might explain what life is. Um, and Schrodinger even thought about this in his book uh, when he talked about this idea that there might be other laws of physics ne necessary to explain life. So he talked about how current physics could explain some features of life, but it didn't answer the ultimate question of what life is. And I think, in fact, life is a very non-intuitive phenomena, even though we are life. 
um, and that we might be surprised by the kind of answers we have. So I'd like to turn Schrodinger's question around and say life is what instead of what is life because we'll be quite surprised by the answers. Um, and so this brings to the question that if we, we don't really have a fundamental understanding of life, could we actually recognize alien life if we saw it? So we saw, you know, at the beginning, all of those vast possibilities, um, but, and we've been looking for alien life um, for a few decades now, and we haven't found any evidence. Are we looking for the right things? Do we know what we're talking about when we're looking for life? Um, and of course, it was mentioned at the beginning that maybe, maybe we've already seen alien life, but we didn't really recognize it. Um, so, uh, so I've been really interested in this question. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of Hollywood uh, or other, you know, film industry renditions of aliens. Um, so this is a Dalek, uh, you know, from uh, Doctor Who, um, which I was trying to find, you know, interesting aliens to to talk about. And I, I guess the word Dalek is related to to Czech word uh, Daleko. Um, so, so I picked this one, which I thought was kind of fun. But um, you know, any alien you might imagine um, is still within the boundaries of our human imagination, right? So we have a lot of things that we've tried to imagine as the alien, but we don't really have a concrete idea of what, what aliens could be. And I think that, that our imagination is actually not even rich enough to encompass the possibilities for alien life. Um, and part of the reason for this is I already noted that space is very big, um, but if we think about the space of possibilities for alien life, we can start by thinking about chemistry because life emerges in chemistry, right? So the origin of life we think happened on Earth about four billion years ago with the first chemical life forms, the first cells emerging um, and then evolving into all of the life and diversity of structure we see on our own planet. But when we talk about chemical space, it's actually um, you know, the space of molecules. What kinds of molecules can be produced on a planet? That space is very huge. And it's actually, I think, much larger than just thinking about the number of galaxies in the entire universe, those billions of galaxies, there's billions of possible molecules. Um, and in fact, um, it's actually hard to estimate how many possible molecules there are. So when you're just combining elements of the periodic table, you have this huge combinatorial possibility space of things you can build. And then when you try to think about all possible technologies, it's almost unimaginable. So life lives in this possibility space of things that can be created um, that's very large. Um, and so trying to imagine what other kinds of things could evolve in that space is very hard for us right now without an understanding of what the phenomena of life is. So I think this kind of issue of thinking about what objects or what molecules or what technologies could exist or what kinds of forms of life is really critical to thinking about the question of what is life. And so I mentioned that you know we, we know about the elements in the periodic table and we know that we can make molecules out of them. And some molecules are very complex because they require a lot of elements to be combined to make them and they require making a lot of very specific bonds. So the molecule I'm showing here is taxol. It's produced by plants, but it's also used as an anti-cancer drug. And this is an example of a very complex molecule. It's a molecule we don't find outside of life. Um, and because it's got so many parts to try to build this precise structure out of that huge space of possible, possible molecules. Um, and so part of the, the way that we're thinking about, uh, you know, how could we understand what life is and how can we understand what possibilities it creates is actually to look at the complexity in the objects it creates and talk about how we could construct backwards from a complex object like this, an understanding that it must have been produced by life and that information was necessary to constrain the space of possibilities to make this specific molecule. Um, so molecules are kind of hard for most of us to think about. So I like to use Lego as an analogy. Um, so here I'm showing um, the pieces that are necessary to assemble the Hogwarts castle out of Lego. Um, and so if you look at just the pieces, it doesn't look anything like a castle. Um, and you could ask the question, you know, if I was just shaking a tray of these Legos, what's the likelihood of forming the castle that I'm showing on this slide? And of course, you know, the chances of that spontaneously forming out of those Legos uh, is infinitely small. And we don't expect that to ever happen in the history of the universe. Yet on our planet, we have many people that have built that exact Lego castle. So it's a, it's a castle that's built, you know, by many children and many adults around the world. Um, because we have instructions to be able to build that. There's a, an informational pattern um, that allows us to construct that specific object. 
Um, and if we actually think about it even more deeper in time, of course, that object exists because there's a history that's selected for it. So Lego were invented. Uh, you know, castles were built over many centuries. A story was written about a little wizard boy that went to school in a castle. And so all of these pieces of this history are necessary for this specific structure to exist. Um, and so that's sort of the feature that we're interested in is Lego Hogwarts is a very rare object. If you tried to think about all the objects you could build out of this set of Legos, it would be, you know, it would be very, very large indeed. There, there's probably more possible structures to build out of this Lego than there are, you know, stars in the universe. So, um, so there's, there's a huge combinatorial space. Um, and so what we're trying to do is actually formalize that feature and talk about why is it that we have this intuition that Lego Hogwarts is not possible uh, to build. Um, and the way to think about that is really to, to think about all the objects that the universe makes that require evolution or selection or information to produce them. And to really talk about a boundary. So simple molecules, things not like taxol, things like methane or oxygen are easy to produce on planets. They don't require evolution. Um, but we talk about uh, sort of a boundary where these objects are too complex, they require too many steps to make them, that you now need a, an information processing system that selects those steps to build those objects. And this becomes a way to talk about life detection because we can talk about what's the minimal amount of information or the steps necessary to build these objects, and is it sufficiently large that we wouldn't expect those objects to form in the absence of evolution. And so, um, so this gets into sort of this idea of other laws of physics, because once you start to think about life, not in terms of what life is, but what does it make in the universe that wouldn't be possible without life, we build this kind of new vision of what life is. And life is this physics that builds up into the space of possible objects that could be created along very specific historical paths. So once I know how to make windows and I know how to make doors, um, objects like a castle are possible and I can build up into the space to create that. So I'm showing sort of a much more abstract depiction here that might apply to molecules or Lego objects or any such other object by combining pieces that you've built before to make a whole diversity of objects. And this is actually how we think about the physics of life. It's the physics of this possibility space and how new things are created in that space in this way that builds on past objects that have been created in a planet's history on a biosphere. Um, so I have this sort of vision of life that's quite different than standard definitions for life, um, where I really think about life as this lineage of how information is allowing the construction of new objects and more complexity over time. So the origin of life happens in chemistry, but this process of selecting and building up more complex structures um, occurs over the whole history of life on Earth. And this allows us to maybe talk about life as the phenomena of how information structures matter on planets and how that builds into things like us. Um, and so the possibility space for that is actually quite huge. So our planet evolved along a particular set of paths to create us, but what aliens might look like could be totally different depending on those few first steps in chemistry and, and what kind of possibility space uh, the life there started building into. Um, so a key feature of this is not to think about life as the cell. It's not about the individual. It's about the continuity of life on a planet and this idea that it's building more complexity over time and really thinking about ourselves as lineages and connected in this entire history as one example of life that's unfolding on a planet and creating novelty um, and innovation. And so I, I like this view of life because I think it, it shows how connected we all are and how connected we are to the history of our planet and how evolving into technology is creating new possibilities for life. So for the last part of my talk in the last few minutes, I just wanted to talk about how we could discover alien life. Um, and so most people have an idea that we're going to go out into that universe of possibilities of, of galaxies and planets. And even in our solar system, we have many places like Titan and Enceladus that are moons of Saturn or Europa, that's a moon of Jupiter, that we might want to go and look for life. But I actually think that one of the most um, exciting sort of new paradigms for thinking about the search for alien life is how can we actually take this idea that life is, is the, the physics that explores these possibility spaces um, and study it in the lab and actually maybe discover new life, alien life, with a really different kind of chemistry than our own life in the lab. 
Um, and so one of the issues I mentioned at the beginning is we don't necessarily know how to see alien life. So we need to build new theories about what life is and new technologies to be able to see it. And just in the history of life on our own planet, we actually didn't know about microbes or viruses for most of human history. We had to invent new technologies like microscopes to allow us to see life on our planet. And we didn't know about galaxies or planets around other stars until we invented telescopes. And of course, now we're inventing artificial intelligences that allow us to, amount, to um, study very large data sets and actually look for patterns in that data. And so this might actually be one of the features that'll be really necessary for us to be able to see what life is, because life is this um, structure that's been evolving over time and building up complexity and all of that information is necessary to identify, to really identify these features as life. And we do that, um, you know, we have a way of talking about actually measuring in the lab this, um, this theory I'm talking about building up, we call it assembly theory. And for a molecule, if you look at the way a molecule is built up um, from uh, uh, elements, you can actually look at those features in a measuring instrument in a chemistry lab called a mass spectrometer. And so we actually have a way of measuring this sort of evolved complexity of objects in the laboratory that might allow us to do experiments to be able to test for it. And the first way that we were thinking about doing it is actually for life detection off Earth um, by looking at um, data from biological systems on Earth, abiotic systems, things like meteoritic, meteoritic samples. And NASA had sent, um, you know, blinded samples that we actually didn't know their origin. And this, was, this work was done in my collaborator Lee Cronin's lab, um, where they were actually able to show that if we look at the molecules that life produces, we don't see, um, we see molecules with a, a, a value of the minimal number of steps, what we call the assembly index, how hard is it to build them above 15, but we don't see any non-living samples producing that. So our conjecture was if we go to another target in the solar system, like one of the moons of Saturn or Mars or a different place, and we use this mass spectrometry technique, this way of measuring this in the lab, and we find molecules that are of this very high complexity, this high assembly of more than 15 steps to make them, they would be suggestive that there was an evolutionary process on that planet to produce them, that life was there. So this is sort of a life detection mechanism that allows us to detect life independent of what kind of chemistry it has, wherever it is in that chemical space of possibilities. We don't have to make assumptions about the chemistry that it's using, just that it's chemistry that requires an, a system that has evolved information to be able to produce that specific molecule. Um, and then, um, you know, going back to the big picture at the beginning, you know, part of the reason we understand the history of the universe is because we built these very big international collaborative experiments. Um, one of them is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which simulates the Big Bang. If we're looking at the evolution of life on Earth, we might also want to build a big experiment to try to look at the, the possibility space for chemistry. Um, so what is sort of the big bang of the, or, you know, the origin of life? Well, it would be, how does life emerge out of, of a planetary chemistry when a, a planet is exploring that possibility space? Um, so we are trying to develop a theory experimental collaboration to actually search this chemical universe in the lab uh, using artificial intelligence and automated technology to be able to do very large chemical experiments, sort of like the international collaborations that we've done in particle physics in the past to look for new physics. But here we want to do very large chemical experiments to look for new forms of life based on a physics that explains what life is. Um, and these are just, I like this one because it's really fun to look at. So we want a video to end on to imagine the possibilities of life. Um, this is an oil droplet experiment also done in Lee Cronin's lab. Um, and these are little mixtures of just a few chemicals that look like they become alive because they display these very rich behaviors. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing is really trying to test these theories and ideas to be able to say if we could detect when these kind of systems become alive and are, are they different kinds of life than the, the life that has evolved on our planet. Um, and so with that, I'm going to conclude and I will thank my amazing lab and I'm, I'm very happy to join a discussion now and, and thank you so much for having me. Já moc děkuji, Sáro, za tuhle inspirativní uh, wow přednášku. Musím říct, nevím jak publikum, ale mě se občas až zamotala hlava. Neměli jste taky ten pocit? Takový jako 
<laughs> jo, trošku se člověk propadá v těch myšlenkách a tak. Ale trošku jste mě zklamala teda, musím říct. Když mluvíte o těch 15 prvcích, které vlastně nějakým způsobem definují ten život, tak já jsem doufala, že ta odpověď bude 42. I know, I did too, actually. Bylo by to tak nějak, ne, nemyslíte, že by, že by všechno bylo trochu jednodušší, konečně bychom dostali tu správnou odpověď, 42, my tu odpověď už známe dlouho, jenom jsme neznali tu otázku, vy byste předložila tu otázku a my bychom se mohli spokojit s 42 a ona je to 15. Já se zeptám, mě by zajímalo, Záro, sama jste o tom mluvila, že tahleta, tenhle pohled na, na možný život ve vesmíru mimo naši zemi je ve skutečnosti velmi neintuitivní, vlastně to, o čem mluvíte. A to, z čeho se mi zamotala hlava, je právě to, A... že člověk to nedokáže úplně jako pojmout. Jo? Kdy vy sama jste udělala nějaký jako switch ve svém přemýšlení, že jste najednou tu abstraktnost dokázala zachytit konkrétně ve svých myšlenkách? Yeah, uh, so these are both great questions. Um, so just a short answer to the first one and then I want to come back around to it. I'm, I'm not sad that these things are not intuitive. Because I think the history of science has been one of revealing new intuitions about how the world works. Um, so the example I like to give is, is just to think about the laws of gravitation. Um, they're, they're very not intuitive, right? So I, there's, there's no way that I, I could intuit that, um, you know, sitting in my chair right now is because I'm attracted to the earth by this abstract thing that we call the gravitational force. And in fact, you know, after Einstein, we recognize that we're sitting in a curved region of space time. It's very non-intuitive. Um, and I think, um, I think, you know, this actually goes into the second part of your question that I've always been attracted to deep questions and ideas and deep explanations. I started school, um, at a two-year university in the United States. So we have something called community colleges where you just go if you don't really know, uh, you know, like for me it was I didn't know what I wanted to do and I didn't know I wanted, you know, like I had never, my family hadn't been to a four-year university so I didn't really have anyone uh, that had been to college in my family. So I went to this two-year university um, and I took physics and I was, I was completely spellbound by the fact that we could predict things in the universe and go out and look for them. Uh, so the example there was this idea of magnetic monopole. So if you take a magnet and you cut it in half, you always have a north and a south pole. Um, and so theoretical physicists had predicted that you might find an object in the universe that was only a north or only a south pole. Um, and it was consistent with some of our theories, but we never observed it. And so, uh, you know, people were building experiments to go look for it. And this idea was like, mind-blowing to me that that this was you know the frontier of science this is how it works we have ideas that are creative about how the universe might work and we can test them um, and so i really wanted to become a theoretical physicist but i thought theoretical physics was cosmology and particle physics and quantum mechanics um, and i got to my phd and i had a phd advisor that was interested in origins of life he was a cosmologist so he had traditionally studied early universe cosmology which is why i started to work with him but he asked me to think about this problem about life and i was like well biology doesn't seem very fundamental to me i took biology classes um, but more i dug into the origin of life problem i realized part of the issue that that problem had not been solved is because we did not have a deep understanding of what life is and so that really motivated me in my career to pursue this path and and because of my training in theoretical physics and my love of it i tend to think about these sort of very deep abstract properties but how they they open up new ways of thinking about the world and i think life will be such a thing i think when we understand what life is it's going to allow us to imagine that possibility space that we can't right now 
To mě právě zajímalo, jako, jakou, jak důležitou roli hraje to, že jste předtím vlastně se věnovala fakt fyzice a vycházíte z fyziky a nevycházíte, nevycházíte z biologie. E, protože někteří fyzici mi říkají, že biologie je pro ně takový black box, ve kterým právě ty věci, které fungují ve fyzice, tak nějak jako nefungují úplně pravidelně. A, e, a vy jste se do té, do té biologie až přesunula. E, ale jaký význam pro vás má? Je to opravdu, myslíte si, že byste uvažovala stejně, kdybyste předtím neměla vlastně ty fyzikální základy? I don't think I would argue in the same way if I wasn't trained as a physicist because I think the ways that we think about the world are very reflective of our training. Um, so I, you know, I can't not wear a physicist hat because that's just, that's how I think. Um, but I do want to qualify sort of different perceptions of physics that people have. So um, there's one way of thinking about physics as physics is the thing physicists have studied. So physics is laws of gravitation, laws of quantum mechanics, you know, thermodynamics and statistical physics, how energy and work, you know, you know, build, you know, do things. Um, and so, you know, there is a bit of, you know, sometimes a perceived arrogance that physicists think they can take the tools they've developed and apply them to any problem. And in biology, you know, our theories don't work well for many problems in biology. They work well for some, but not this sort of overall picture of understanding what life is. And so when I approach the problem of life as a physicist, I'm not trying to bring in the tools that physics has invented so far. It's much more in the spirit of what, you know, what's traditionally called natural philosophy, which is I am a person that likes to understand Um, the abstract principles that underlie uh, how we might understand things in the universe. And for me, life is one of the most interesting things we don't understand. So the question is, what new principles can we learn by studying life? And they may not look anything like what physics has invented so far. They might just be entirely new physics. And we should approach the phenomena with new eyes and not assume we have all the explanations from it based on existing physics. To je krásný, že jste řekla, že život je jedna z nejzajímavějších věcí, kterou nechápeme. Je to tak? To je vlastně hrozně zajímavý, že? Yes. <laughs> Myslíte si, že během třeba vašeho života, vašeho výzkumu, a tak se dobere, dobereme, nebo vy doberete tomu pochopení, anebo to zůstane vlastně tajemstvím i nadále svým způsobem? I mean, I hope we understand it in my lifetime because that's like, you know, like my whole goal for being. Um, but I, you know, my, my minimum hope is that the work, um, you know, the work that I'm doing and along with many colleagues to try to transform the way we think about the problem will open up new opportunities that the problem might be solved in the next few generations and not remain open. So I think I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're on the right track and that we'll be able to solve it in my lifetime. But I think at bare minimum, the problem is very hard and it really requires radically new thinking. And if I can at least encourage people to get outside of the box of how we've been thinking about it in the past and come up with new questions and new ideas, then we're making progress. No, na to jsem se právě taky chtěla zeptat. To je ta věc, to, že my jsme opravdu, hlavně my lajci, jsme opravdu velice svázaní tím antropocentrickým pohledem, tím, že žijeme na té zemi, že si vlastně velice těžko představujeme život jinak, než, než je ten náš. Máte nějakou třeba i jednoduchou radu, jak vlastně vystoupit out of the box tady tohohle přemýšlení, kterým jsme svázaní? Um, I don't know if I have simple advice, but I guess I, I, I can talk a little bit about my own creative process, um, which is, Dobře. you know, to look at the things that we understand, um, but recognize that, you know, it's not a complete picture. So sometimes I like to make an analogy that, you know, all the little pieces of things we know are part of a, you know, a mosaic almost. So you imagine like a little, little blocks you put together to build a big picture. Um, and it has holes in it, you know, like there's some things that we don't understand yet. And if we 
if we rearrange the pieces, the parts that we know, and we look at them slightly differently, uh, we see like a whole different kind of story emerge. And so I'm interested in the things that are there that we already have a lot to understand, but we haven't been looking at it that way. So I like to flip ideas on their head and try to think in new ways that way. Um, and so I think thinking about aliens really requires that because uh, you know, in English, the word alien really means other things we don't understand, you know, not just extraterrestrial. Um, and so I think there's this kind of implicit in the assumption of alien is this thing beyond our comprehension. And I think that we really need to think in new ways to really understand what is it that we're talking about when we say that. Um, and it requires a lot of creativity. So I find a lot of enrichment in my work from artists um, and philosophers and people outside of science, because I think they think quite deeply about the nature of life um, in ways that haven't been brought into scientific practice yet. Takže tou cestou je občas se zkusit, zkusit ukročit stranou, podívat se na věci trochu jinak, obrátit je, nezůstávat u toho svého pohledu a taky asi hodně diskutovat s ostatními lidmi. Zajímalo by mě, když, když mluvíte o, o tom, co děláte s obyčejnými lidmi, tak které třeba jejich představy o, o vesmíru a o mimozemském životě vás nejvíc pobavily? Yeah. I, I, I like to play with ideas a lot um, and I get inspiration from everywhere. Um, so, I, I mean, for me, everything is a creative playground. And I guess this is one of the reasons that I really like thinking about the problem of life um, because we're living and everything in our environment is, you know, kind of a manifestation of this thing we call life. Um, and so, you know, even, you know, like when you're out, outside, you know, like in a natural environment, it's very clear everything is life. But even when you're inside, everything around you was built by human ingenuity, uh, which is itself, you know, the product of several billion years of evolution of life on Earth. And then, you know, learning by human beings. So it's a product of the same sort of fundamental process. Um, so, so for me, everything is sort of a playground for thinking about these ideas. And when I talk to different people, I'm always trying to, to, to turn the insights they have into how I understand this general phenomenon. So this is part of this flipping. It's, you know, like there, there's features people from different areas have insights into um, that, that maybe, you know, are very obvious to one kind of way of thinking and not obvious to another. And, and one I can give you is I think a lot of artists in particular right now are playing with the boundary between biology and technology and understanding how one transitions into another um, and that that might be a, you know, a kind of continuous process that the boundaries between them are kind of gray. And, um, but if you go in, into you know, academia and a traditional biology department, you know, none of the, the biologists would think that technology is a manifestation of an evolutionary process um, or that technology is as much life as a bio, biological uh, evolved object. Um, but if you go to complex systems group, you know, they're studying technology as evolving all the time. So I like to see how these different communities are thinking about these things and try to figure out, you know, what's the story underneath all of them that seems to be the commonality between the ways they're talking about these phenomena. And I think that's the art of theoretical physics is, is you know, you, you study this thing in as many different ways as possible, but you try to dig deeper and dig deeper and dig deeper and find the one core thing that really is explaining all the rest of the details. Um, and so that's for me what, what sort of the art of my practice of theoretical physics is, is trying to find those patterns under what I hear from different people. A vzpomínáte na nějaký okamžik, na nějaký moment nebo setkání, které vám hodně proměnilo úhel pohledu? Yeah, um, I think I've been shifting it right along, but I did... Um, I did organize a meeting um, in 2015. It was called Reconceptualizing the Origins of Life, and it was held at Carnegie Institution in Washington, DC. And the whole idea of that meeting, that conference, was to um, try to have new ways of thinking about 
what the origin of life is, and in particular to bring in more abstract ideas, more theoretical principles about how we could think about it. And that meeting was actually the one that I started my collaboration with Lee Cronin, who does, who has this big experimental chemistry lab, and he was trying to build experiments to search chemical space for the origin of life. And we had kind of similar ideas about what life is. So I think that was probably one particularly transformative moment. But I think the thing with thinking about life deeply in this way is you get to new ideas all the time. I, I you know, I, I don't think I have a static picture of what life is, and I don't think I could hold on to it and have made as much progress in my career as I have because I'm always willing to change the way I was thinking about it. Um, so the thoughts themselves are a constantly changing and evolving structure as we're learning more, as we're figuring out how to do experiments, as we're getting more data about how to test the theory. Um, and so the theory itself is being built through this process of just doing the science. And I'm continually surprised uh, by how weird life is. I always say life is what and we're going to be surprised, but I'm surprised on a daily basis about thinking about this because it is really different and, and not like ideas that we've had in the past about uh, you know what the how the universe behaves and what it does and fundamentally what it's about, um, and so some of the new insights I, I think are really fun. Je zábavné, jak o tom mluvíte a úplně vaše nadšení jako kdyby proudilo tady do nás, přestože jste daleko v Arizóně. <laughs> Ale právě ta schopnost ne, nezůstávat rigidně u nějakých myšlenek, které už jsem obsáhla, pokračovat dál, pořád zůstávat v dynamice, v tom vývoji, ve schopnosti měnit pohled na věc a tak, to chce přece hroznou energii. Odkud to berete? Um, I think I love the creative process. I mean, it's kind of, a, it, it makes me happy to come up with new ideas. And I particularly like the non-intuitive ones, so I'm really attracted to ideas that feel very new, um, particularly if I think they explain something. Um, and so, so this excites me when you have a new insight, um, and it really drives me um, to, to, to try to push myself further. And in particular, when I share those with other people, so like one of my favorite things is you know, sharing an idea that someone immediately, you know, understands why that is an interesting idea, but it's not something they thought of before. And those kind of moments, I, I like, they're, they're like, you know, like I, this almost like a natural high for me. It's like, just, it feels really good. Um, so, so I, I like, I, I guess the, cre the creativity and I also have a, you know, I have amazing colleagues and amazing students, um, that I work with and, and there's just so much energy because they're so excited about the ideas and, and, and discovering things and understanding more about ourselves and, and what we are and our place in the universe and, and the power of new ideas and transforming our future. So I think, I think all these things really resonate with, with how I think about it um, because I think there are new things to be discovered and I think knowledge is transformative as far as what it can do for the way we think about ourselves and the potential we have in the future for what we can create and, and how we can understand where we're going um, as a, you know, as a global, you know, civilization. So, um, so all those things, I think, keep me very motivated. I mean, it's hard work, but it's also very fun and exciting. <laughs> yeah. Kdybyste si představila, že tady máte plný sál malých českých desetiletých dětí, dovedla byste jim, kdybychom byli ty děti, říct svými slovy tu vaši hypotézu o té podstatě života, jak vlastně je konstruovaný, dokázala byste to říct, kdybychom byli děti, vysvětlit nám to? Uh, that's a great question because my son is actually 10 years old, so it's a good age. <laughs> for, <laughs> tak to máte asi na um, Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Um, you know, he hasn't asked me that question very directly, like, you know, what is life, mom? But, um, but he knows what I work on. So, um, but I think, um, you know, the way I think about life is, you know, if you if you try to imagine, well. I, th I think life is, is the universe's way of being creative is, is probably the most fundamental way. So, you know, not all the things that you could imagine to exist will ever be created. And life is the process by which things get to be made. Like they, they, get, to, they get to exist. Um, 
And so maybe this is not the best description for a 10 year old, but but if you you imagine that there there's a possibility space of things you can create, life is what what chooses what gets to actually be made. Um, and um, and when you get, you know, when you when you you're in sort of standard physics, things are simple and things can get produced. But when you get to objects like us, you know, the space of possibilities is so large that it's very unlikely or impossible in standard physics to explain why we exist. Um, and so so there has to be some additional structure there. And um, and the way I think about it is that the history actually allows what gets produced in the future. Um, and that's really the, the the feature of life that I find most interesting. I don't know if that was 10 year old level. Sorry, my, my yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Um. Tak to potom zkusíte na tom synovi a dáte nám vědět, jestli to pochopil. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I might, I should have tested it on him before coming to you guys, but yeah, I'll, I'll ask him for a critique. <laughs> My máme v Česku v Českou takovou písničku, která se jmenuje Život je jen náhoda. A mě by vlastně zajímalo, do jaké míry jako vy tam připouštíte náhodu, anebo ne. Yeah, I don't think life is a coincidence. Um, I think that life is um, is about using information from the past to build things in the present. Um, and so there's this sort of his, like the history determines some features of, of things, right? So we can't, you know, we, we, we're made out of cells because cells evolved billions of years ago. Um, so, so that's not coincidence, but I do think that there is a genuine mechanism that appears in life that doesn't appear in the rest of physics about novelty. Um, like where do genuinely new things come from? And it seems that life does sometimes get very creative and predict thing and produce things that you might not be able to predict. Um, and so that feature is really interesting to me and maybe resonates more with this idea of um, coincidence or, or some kind of spontaneity. Um, and so I think it's the tension between those, the historical dependency, but also this ability to generate new things. That is one of the most interesting features of life. Ale ta náhoda se vyloučit nedá. <laughs> Funkce té náhody. Případně. <laughs> hmm. Probably yes. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say no to anything because I need to be open to ideas. But but I think I think probably that's that's fair anyway, even outside of that. So, yeah. To je vlastně zajímavý. Teď, teď to, to, čemu vy se věnujete ve svém výzkumu a je vlastně je hypotéza, kterou, a už jsme to zmínili, možná i během vašeho života potvrdíte, ale možná taky ne. Jak vlastně vnímáte tuhle tu nejistotu vědec v takových těch oborech, které právě jde, kde ta, ta, ta metoda vědecká je přesně to, mám hypotézu, kterou ověřím, funguje nebo nefunguje a posuneme se dál a vy možná za svého života jako v praxi nepotvrdíte tu svoji hypotézu, vzhledem k tomu, že se třeba nenajde ten mimozemský život. Nevadí vám to? Um. It's not necessarily a problem because I think, um, well, I think that's just the nature of science. So I think if you want to be a scientist, you have to accept you might not find answers to your questions. Um, and actually that part for me is one of the more exciting things about doing science. So, you know, most people I, I know that are scientists, especially ones working at the frontier of what we know, and myself included, you know, like part of the excitement and thrill is the not knowing. Um, and the, the constantly not being sure that you're on the right direction, like that, that's kind of, you know, like, I guess we're thrill seekers in that way. Um, <laughs> it's not quite like, you know, like jumping out of an airplane, but it gives you a kind of certain, you know, excitement about the work you're doing to have that uncertainty. Um, but I think, um, you know, hypotheses are, uh, and testing hypotheses is obviously core to the scientific practice and being able to make predictions and then validate them. But I think that there's something deeper that I'm actually much more interested in, which is the nature of explanations in science. And so, um, 
you know, I can give an example. So I, I always like to use the laws of gravitation because I think most people understand, you know, gravity as a theory. Mm -hmm. So gravity as an explanation was developed to explain planetary motion, to explain terrestrial motion, like why I'm sitting in this chair right now, as I gave the example before, to explain why balls roll down hills, et cetera, et cetera. So this theory of, of motion of gra gravitating objects actually unified things that happen in the heavens and things that happen on Earth, which was a totally radical idea when um, you know Newton's generation came up with this. Uh, and so, um, so there's a broad explanation for a whole variety of phenomena, and they're all connected by this kind of one very simple understanding. But when you go to make a prediction, you know, it might be that you want to predict, you know, when is Mercury going to be in this position around the sun? And you can do that with the theory, um, and you can test that prediction. But the validity of the explanation is actually all the pieces coming together and it being coincident with a whole variety of phenomena, not just one hypothesis that Mercury should be here on whatever day. Um, and so when I'm thinking about the nature of life, I think we need a broad explanation for if, if life is a category of nature, if it's what, what philosophers call a natural kind, it's not just something we subjectively think is there, but it really is an objective feature of the way the universe works, then there's a broad category of things that would be included as life. And I, what I, I view my work as doing is trying to build that broad explanation when you have that, that, that theoretical explanation, that foundation, there are specific predictions you might make. And each one of those hypotheses and predictions builds a validation of that whole paradigm. But no single experiment is going to do it. So, for example, the data I showed on the life detection, you know, part, part of the theory is this idea that there's a complexity threshold above which you only find objects that life produces. And we validated that for mo molecules um, uh, using samples from Earth. Um, obviously, there will be a lot more refinements on those kind of experiments. But, you know, another set of experiments we want to do is to actually demonstrate the origin of life from a, a chemical search engine, like a robot exploring chemical space. Whether we'll be able to do that or not is unclear. Um, whether we'll be able to use the same theory to predict what kind of chemistry would arise in a life form on Mars and how that should be different from a life form on Titan is another set of predictions we could make and test. Um, but which of those are actually going to be the ones that actually pan out is, is hard to say. But I think part of the reason I'm excited about this set of ideas is because there's so many things that you can make hypotheses about and make testable experiments that are all built into the same sort of set of ideas. And that part really excites me. Hmm, hmm. Já vyzvu, možná na chviličku, ještě mám tady určitě pár otázek, ale chtěla bych teď vyzvat publikum, jestli náhodou tady mezi tím se vám neurodila v hlavě nějaká otázka. Neurodila. Tak já vás jenom prosím, zkuste popřemýšlet, budu se ptát dál, ale kdyby vás něco napadlo, budeme moc rádi. <laughs> Přemýšlela, já jsem dělala poměrně nedávno rozhovor s jednou českou astrobioložkou, která má ale mnohem víc vklad v té, v té biologii a ona teda ještě zároveň je i autorkou z sci-fi, což je taky zajímavá kombinace, protože ona si vlastně některé ty věci jako testuje nebo, nebo zkouší, jak by to mohlo být a vytváří si svoje mimozemské světy a civilizace. A říkala, došli jsme k velmi zajímavým věcem, jako právě tak, jak my si nedovedeme ten život představit, protože si ho představujeme v těch našich podmínkách, tak, tak ona to posunula právě na to, že lze pravděpodobně mít život v něčem, v podmínkách, které pro nás jsou třeba úplně toxické, ale jinde jsou to podmínky, ve kterých bude bujet život, možná i bují někde ve vzdálených galaxiích. Přemýšlíte o tom? Máte nějakou takovou svoji jako oblíbenou představu, jak to třeba někde může fungovat? Yeah, so I think um, I think that's a, a good observation. So even for life on Earth, there's lots of places that we couldn't live as humans, but life seems to thrive. 
Uh, so, you know, uh, astrobiologists will talk about extremophile organisms. So these are organisms that live in hot springs. They live deep underground. Um, you know, they live in ices. So they live in conditions that are, you know, that we would consider completely extreme and not things that we could live in. So we do have some sense that um, that life can persist and even thrive in environments that aren't conducive to humans, for example. Um, and so, so it opens up the possibilities of different environments in the solar system or on planets orbiting other stars, potentially hosting life, even though it might be toxic to life on Earth. And a, a good example is Titan in our own solar system, which is a moon of Saturn that I've mentioned already. I love Titan. I think it's one of the most amazing planetary bodies that we've discovered. It has a, an atmosphere, a very thick atmosphere, um, and, um, and it also has lakes and it has weather. And so it's the only other uh, planetary body in our solar system that has complex weather patterns like Earth does. But the thing that's weird about Titan is it's it's liquid on the surface is not actually water, it's methane, it's gasoline, gas basically. And it rains on Titan gas and, and things that would be water on Earth are actually rocks on Titan. So all the, the um, H2O is solid in the solid phase and, and the, the sort of things that would normally be, you know, gases in our atmosphere are liquid on Titan because it's so cold. So this environment seems very alien. Um, it's not a place that any life from Earth could live because there's no water. Um, the chemistry is totally different. Um, but, you know, complex chemistry might be happening on Titan and it might actually be living chemistry and we don't know. So there's a, a mission coming up called Dragonfly from NASA that's actually going to go and study Titan to try to look for these kind of possibilities that could be there in what seems this very toxic environment. So I, I think those are, are really exciting um, and, and interesting kinds of ways of thinking about the possibilities for life is just an environment that's totally, totally different. We couldn't live there. What could live there? Um, and lots of people do thought experiments about that, um, but we don't know. <laughs> Dosud, když se bavíme třeba o možnostech života, jestli třeba někdy byl, nebo bude, nebo je třeba život na Marsu, tak se právě hodně mluví o té vodě, mm -hmm. jako o podmínce toho života. Ale vlastně to, o čem mluvíte vy, tak i tuhle podmínku maže. Prostě zase je to jenom naše vnímání, že my k životu potřebujeme vodu. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Takže je to vlastně ještě dal, je, to, je to velký posun. Já, kdy, když jsem se takhle bavila s, s lidmi, kteří právě, které zajímají tyhle ty extrémní podmínky života nebo mimozemské civilizace a tak, tak mám takový pocit, že jejich oblíbený zvířátko je želvuška. Je i vaše oblíbené zvířátko želvuška, což je vlastně zvířátko, které se používá pro testování života v opravdu v extrémních podmínkách. Želvušky už cestovaly na, na, do vesmíru, želvušky se drtí v mixéru, želvušky žijou v toxickém prostředí, předpokládá se, že přežijí i radiaci a podobně. Zajímá vás tohle zvířátko? Oh, right. <laughs> Mám dlouhé otázky. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's great. No, it's great. Um, it's funny because um, you know, it'd be, good, it'd be great if we had a picture of them uh, for people in the audience. But tardigrades are so cute. They're these tiny, tiny. You know, you need a microscope to see them. Uh, microorganisms, but they look like little bears with many legs. Uh, you know, they have a kind of like a an alien-looking face. But so they're they're really cute. Um, but the reason that astrobiologists are interested in them is because. Um, they're incredibly hardy, like they're very resistant to in, like environmental stress uh, to the point that that they can survive in space um, in, in encapsulated in a rock. And so they become a really good case study um, of how life can survive very extreme conditions. But in particular, whether, you know, if we had a, you know, a meteorite hit a planet and eject material into space and there happened to be life inside the rocks, could it survive transport between planets? And this is very relevant um, for Mars and Earth because we know we have rocks from Mars on Earth. We've discovered some of them. And, and one of the most famous cases of potential alien life detection was in 1996 when people thought they found 
life in rocks from Mars, and it became sort of an international sensation. Um, but we also think there's rocks from Earth on Mars. And so tardigrades have become interesting because uh, some scientists think that if a tardigrade was in one of those rocks, it could actually make the journey and get to Mars. Um, and so maybe maybe life emerged on Mars and came to Earth or Earth life went to Mars, but they could have similar life on both planets. Um, and tardigrades are kind of key to that, that sort of set of hypotheses is demonstrating that at least some life forms could make that journey. Už se mi zase trošku motá hlava <laughs> z těch představ přenosů života z Marzu. <laughs> Takže možná vlastně, možná jsme všichni Marťani. Yeah. That would be cool. <laughs> um, zase vyzývám publikum, protože měl by teď být váš čas na vaše otázky. Nemáme žádnou otázku. Výborně, tamhle. Já vás poprosím mikrofon, jestli byste byla tak hodná a mluvila do mikrofonu. Je to otázka, Sáro. Hi, Sarah. That was a fantastic talk. Um, really, really fascinating and it's so joyous. And that I love when space and life talks are really beautiful. Um, you mentioned that you're inspired by a lot of different philosophies and ideas, and I was just wondering if you could kind of talk on some of like maybe the philosophical traditions or ideas or epistemologies that you've encountered that have really kind of sparked things in you. I'm thinking, you know, we have Spinoza who says life is in every cell or a monad, and then you have indigenous ideas where, you know, life is collective. Um, what are the types of things that you've encountered where you're like, oh, wow, this, this is great and it can be incorporated? Um, that's an amazing question. You know, I, I, I pick up a lot of things socially, so I haven't dug into the philosophical literature as much as I could. I mean, I did read, um, you know, Leibniz obviously was a physicist also, but he has a great piece called the Mona, monodology, which is about, uh, you know, like talking about the concept of the soul in life and how it's, it's, it's transitioned between different organisms. And, and, um, and, and you mentioned another, a couple of great examples. I think, you know, it's interesting to me studying all these different ideas from different places, how how similar they are, but maybe projecting some feature of what we're trying to understand into a different space. So I actually think life is a collective property, and I really think about life as a systems level thing. But I think that the way that those systems are built up is over time. And so this idea of these lineages or the the sort of, you know, like the monads that are in objects or these things that are actually you know, causing the next set of things to exist are actually also a part of that structure. Um, so I think I think integrating some of these different traditions and ideas is actually where it, where it gets most exciting because I think they fit together in really interesting ways. Um, so so I don't know if I have um, you know key influences so much as trying to get an understanding of sort of broad sets of ideas that have been out there and how they can how they can contribute to new understanding. Um, and I guess some of the, the, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting about being a theoretical physicist working on these kind of ideas is, is also contributing potentially new ideas to philosophy. So I, you know, no idea is really new. I always find this interesting, like, you know, ideas exist in, in culture and they come up in different places in different ways, sometimes at the same time. So we have this kind of idea um, that I've been really uh, sort of romanticized by about um, about the nature of time in living things, um, in the sense that this idea of thinking about life as being the way the universe can build specific objects, that, 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 that history becomes important to talking about what a thing like you or I is. We're a lineage. We're not just the instantaneous object that exists now, but parts of us are 3.8 billion years old, which is around the time that life first emerged. So I think about sort of the historical object, the thing of this these new patterns emerging over time and, and how they're built into a particular given structure as being the thing that is a living object. So, so I, for example, you know, am a, a, something that might be extended 3.8 billion years. Um, and so this idea of thinking about objects and, and time as a material property, that it's actually a physical attribute of evolved objects, that they have a size and time, and this is what we're talking about when we talk about how to build them up, is really interesting to me. And it turns out that there's a lot of modern philosophers talking about 
object-oriented ontologies and the idea of like hyper objects um, from Tim Morton. And so, so it's interesting that some of these ideas are coming up in other intellectual spaces where they're thinking about materiality and, and kind of new understandings of, of what objects are and particularly evolved objects, completely independent um, from the work we're doing, but converging on similar ideas. So, so I love I love the way culture and science intersect and, and where new ideas come up and, and when are they culturally relevant. So um, it's not a, it's not a direct answer to your question, but maybe hopefully it gives some more framing of how I think about these things. But I I love looking out for them. <laughs> I Thank guess. you. To je právě hezký, jak si dovedete i ty otázky posunout tak a přetavit si to, aby, abyste vlastně řekla něco z toho, jak uvažujete a tak. Mně napadlo, že vlastně tak, jak mluvíte o tom, když jste mluvila o těch myšlenkách, které vznikají na různých místech a různě se na sebe nabalují, že je to vlastně podobný proces, jako je ten princip života, jak o něm mluvíte, že to z té historie vzniká ta současnost, tak stejně tak ty myšlenkové procesy v tom světě od toho vzniku, kdy člověk začal uvažovat, tak vlastně to všechno si taky vlastně neseme nějak pořád sebou, jako memeticky. <laughs> Ale to se ne, nebudu, já se do filozofii pouštět nebudu. Zase koukám se, jestli tady není nějaká otázka. Tahle byla výborná, nemáte ještě jednu? <laughs> Určitě, prosím. Děkuju. Máme další otázku. Můžu česky teda? Určitě můžete. Uh, jo, je to slyšet. Já bych se chtěla zeptat, uh, jestli jste o své práci uvažovala, uh, jakým směrem vlastně půjdete, čím se budete zabývat, jestli vás už něco inspirovalo v dětství anebo v mládí, uh, nebo jak jste ta vlastně tady do toho směru se dostala. A k té otázce mě přivedlo to, že když mě bylo asi osm, tak jsem se dívala na, na listy na stromech a připadalo mě, že tam určitě objevím nějakou zákonitost, jak ty, jak ty listy rostou a proč zrovna rostou tak, jak rostou, ale tenkrát jsem nic neobjevila a až v pozdní dospělosti jsem se dozvěděla, že existuje Fibonacciho číslo, podle, podle kterého, ne, že bych teda na to byla nějaký, že bych byla matematik, ale podle kterého vlastně roste nebo se utváří různý útvary v přírodě, tak mě by zajímalo, že se mi jako potvrdilo to, co jsem v tom dětství nějak tak jako tušila a neuměla jsem s tím zacházet. Tak by mě zajímalo, jestli třeba vás někdy v dětství nebo v mládí raným napadlo něco, co souvisí s vaší prací dneska. A že si to potom později vlastně potvrdila. A že se, a že mm-hmm. se to potom takhle potvrdí. Děkujeme. Um, I love your story. That's that's mm. fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, you know, it's it's funny for me because I, you know, I always was interested in science, but I never like I never thought about it um, as a career for myself. Uh, probably till I was, you know, a senior in high school, so about 17, 18 years old. And then I I, I told the story at the beginning about um, when. I went to my my first year of college and I got really interested in physics and that did it for me. I was just like, I love physics. I I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, but before that, I was I was raised in a very artistic household. So my my dad is actually a hairstylist and my mom, uh, she she sells antiques. Um, so she deals with very old things. Um, and they both are you know like much more artistic than scientific. And so. I think the deep roots for me, um, you know, I, not being exposed to a culture of science, I just, I just had a nat- like a lot of curiosity. I think as a child, but I think I always was very deeply perplexed, um, and I, and I, I really didn't understand how things work or how you know people explained how things work. So I, I guess maybe I, you know, what really attracted me to science was really trying to understand some of that for myself or try to. Um, you know, to discover something new. And I just, I just felt like it was the ultimate expression of the creative process to be able to do that, but actually have, um, 
you know, like I want, I wanted to be an artist when I was a teenager and I used to want to work with pastels in particular, cause you can push the color all around and do, you know, really beautiful pictures. Um, so this was sort of, sort of one of the career things I was thinking about was actually being a painter or um, working in pastel and like, and, and trying to produce art. And I think what I really like about science is I feel like it's that same sort of creative process, but you're doing it with an understanding of how the world works. So you're trying to push, you know, the, the colors around the page, but you're trying to build a new understanding of like what the universe is. Um, and, and that kind of practice is, is very different than what we do in art because you have to be able to test your ideas and you have to be able to validate them against experiments. And there's this whole process we undergo. So, um, but I think that that sort of creativity under constraints is really what got me and, and, and learning, you know, like I don't believe in ultimate truth, but learning some things more about understanding um, what we are in our place in the universe. And I, I don't think there was any sort of aha moment in my childhood. I think it just gradually blew up grew up over time that I really love being creative, but I also really want to understand things. Um, and so that combination becomes very, you know, like there's a unique set of things you can do if those are sort of your two passions. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's how I ended up where I am. I don't, I don't think it was a very linear path or a very, you know, deep roots kind of thing. Um, yeah. Když mluvíte o tom umění, nemáte třeba umění jako koníčka? Nemalujete nebo ne, nevěnujete se něčemu takovému ještě? Um, I love fashion. I, I like, like, um, so I actually, you know, my, my sort of dream aspiration is to, you know, have a next career. I like, I love being a theoretical physicist and I want to stay doing that, but I would really love um, to get in the fashion industry and, and design clothes. Um, so my <laughs> hobby is like, I, I, I love finding um, nice pieces and, and style. Like, I just love style. I think it's, I think fashion is one of the most interesting artistic e expressions because it's so social. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's very um, intellectually interesting to me because social reality changes so fast and fashion is kind of a critical component of how we socially signal it to each other and how we think about the social environment. And Um, and so I think there's some really deep insights um, by thinking about, you know, us as a, a species that has invented this sort of thing called fashion. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, a, it's a hobby, but it's also, I think, intellectually quite interesting. And there's this great infographic from um, Stuart Brand, uh, who um, is involved with the Long Now Foundation. So they do a lot with long-term thinking, but he talks about the spheres of like of, of human thinking and human culture. And so there's nature on the bottom, which is what physics deals with. And then there's all these sort of other spheres that move and that moves very slow. So our understanding of that is pretty solid, you know, and like maybe the laws of gravitation don't change for a few hundred years before we slightly revise them. But then there's things like, economics which moves kind of fast and then like the fastest thing is fashion it's like fashion changes like every day right so um so i like trying to connect sort of i guess <laughs> slow and deep components of human culture with these sort of fast and dynamic ones and thinking about the dichotomy um and how they influence the way we interact with the world um so i guess that's why i'm so attracted to fashion i just find it really interesting for that reason Ne, nepřemýšlela jste někdy, když, když popustíte úzdu své fantazii a vypravíte se někam, kde možná jsou nějaké mimozemské civilizace v nějakých vzdálených galaxiích, třeba tam opravdu nějaká civilizace je, jak jsou tam ti, ta, ty tvorové oblečení? Um, no. But I, but I'd like to be able to. I think that, uh, yeah. I mean, this, I, I think fashion is is typically quite alien, right? So, like, you know, some of the most interesting things in fashion are like just completely change our conception of of some material reality, and that's exactly what it does. So, I think like its ability to probe the alien is already pretty high on our planet. Um, <laughs> but, but I, I like imagining alien fashion is is is. A brilliant thought exercise, and I will spend some time on it. But I haven't, I haven't quite intellectually gotten to where I'm capable of doing that yet. Yeah. <laughs> Dobře. Zase vybídnu. <laughs> Děkujem. Zase vybídnu publikum. Za chvilku budeme končit. Ještě, ještě tady prostor. Využijte ho, protože já se určitě neptám na všechno, na co byste se chtěli zeptat vy. 
Tak nevadí, já ještě stále mám v zásobníku nějaké otázky. Tak já teďka, vlastně už jsme se toho dotkli, trošku té filozofie. Vlastně když vykročíme, vykročíme trošku jinam od fyziky a od chemie a tak. Um, Jedna z těch zásadních otázek, který lidi řeší a přemýšlí o nich, je, není otázka vzniku života a toho podstaty života, ale smyslu života. Jak, co je smysl života pro vás? Pardon? Oh, that's a very deep question. Um, I, um, I, you know, I struggle with this question. So I, I think, I think life is actually, you know, people talk about purpose not being a part of science. That it's, you know, it's it's too theological concept, too too many um, sort of, you know, uh, teleological overtones. So you know, most of evolutionary theory has tried to move away from the idea that there's a designer or there's any kind of purpose to the universe. Um, but I don't, but I think that, that the universe can evolve things like us that really do have a clear purpose. Um, and for me, the, the purpose is really, it, it's almost, it's novelty or, or and, and in particular, I think, I, you know, I feel very compelled to try to improve uh, things for the future. Like I, I, really, I really believe in the power of ideas and the transformation they can have on um, on our culture, on our material reality, the things that we actually can do and make. Um, and so I really, I find my sense, my sense of purpose as being a part of that process. I'm always sort of mystified by the human imagination, like imagining rockets centuries before we could build them. So I find a strong sense of purpose in trying to imagine what the possibilities for the future are if, if we find you know, new ideas that really explain a lot of things and allow us to do things that we couldn't have done if we didn't have those ideas. Um, and so that's obviously also what I think is deeply intrinsic to the nature of what life is doing. And so I also think of life as being very purposeful generally. Um, and that, that meaning and purpose are really about how we decide to live our life and how we decide to create our own futures because we do actually have agency and choice in that. Um, And so, uh, so for me, that's, that's sort of, I, I feel very deep sense of purpose in my work. <laughs> and I also feel very deep sense of purpose in what life is. Um, and I don't know where that comes from, but I, th I think it's, a, it's an important clue to, to the problems I'm working on. Um, yeah, which might be my bias, but I, yeah. Krásný, děkujem. Neurodila se otázka, abych nezapomněla se ptát vás, jestli nemáte otázky. Dobře, tak jo, tak ještě tady, mám, ještě tady mám otázku a to doufám už nebude tak hluboké a těžké. Mě by zajímalo, určitě sledujete i sci-fi scénu, čtete možná knížky, díváte se na filmy. Je nějaký film nebo nějaká kniha sci-fi, která pro vás hodně znamená nebo která se hodně dotýká něčeho, o čem uvažujete, že, že vás třeba i hodně inspiruje. Jakkoliv si to téma uchopíte, ten budu ráda. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I, I love that you brought up the example of um, uh, the woman who I'd spoken to that's also a science fiction writer and astrobiologist, because I think there's a deep intersection between the creativity of sci-fi and, you know, what becomes science reality. Science fiction writing obviously inspires a lot of people to become scientists. Um, is just one direct connection. But I, I think, um, and I, I interact a lot with science fiction writers um, and have a lot of respect for their work um, as visionaries trying to imagine the future possibilities. But I think one of my favorite pieces um, in modern times is uh, Ted Chang's novella, Story of Your Life, um, which I think is a phenomenal story. So the, the movie Arrival, um, was based on this story. And that's an alien contact story where the main character is a linguist and, sh and her job in that story is to decode the language of this, these aliens, which is very different than our language. Um, and I don't want to give too much of the story away, but a couple of the themes that I really like 
are the way that the the language um, you know is how it structures how we think and also how the alien species and the human species kind of exist differently in time. And I think time, as I mentioned, is pretty deeply related to the physics of life. I didn't get to get into all those details, but I think the way that, that Ted had played with these things in this story um, is pretty significant. Um, and, um, and he has such an interesting process of the way he writes. So I've, I've had conversations with him about that particular story and how he came up with, um, with writing it. But I, th I think it's, it's, it's really brilliant. Um, and really inspiring. And also for me as a mom, like there's this, this very, very heart touching story of a mother, like the linguist is a mother. So like the, it, it just touched me personally on so many levels. Um, but I, but the alien, the way the alien is described, its connection to physics and also language and, and our ability to understand things, I think is quite deep in that story. The movie's great too, but I would recommend doing both. Read the story of your life and then also watch Arrival, and they're, they're totally different percent, like totally different views on the same core story. And I think looking at both of them and, and the juxtaposition is also very telling of the way that we visualize aliens and story and in movies and the way we can think about it in different spaces. Můžete prosím ještě zopakovat jednou to jméno té knihy? Titul. It's called The Story of Your Life. And the movie is Arrival. Yeah. And the author of the story was was Ted Chang. Ted Chang. Tak jo, děkuji. Dobře, tak já úplně naposledy vyzývám, jestli není otázka. <laughs> Pokud ne, tak asi už se budeme pomalu loučit, protože <laughs> myslím, že jsme toho napovídali hodně, hlavně Sára, bylo to úplně skvělé. Já vám moc děkuji, Sáro. Ještě by mě úplně poslední věc. Máte v hlavě nějaký vzkaz, který byste poslala do vesmíru? Oh, um, well, I think, I think since this, is, this whole event is about inspiration, I guess it's just you can find inspiration in anything. Um, so, and I always find this really amazing. I like, I, you know, I get, for my work, you know, my work is all about ideas, but I get them from everywhere. And oftentimes it's like very unexpected what inspires me. Um, and so I find this incredibly enriching and really um, telling of human potential when, when we're open, you know, we're open to, to what's happening around us and letting and letting us kind of guide how we think about things and ingest ingesting new ideas and things so um so i guess i guess that's an important one uh and and the value of creativity which i think is just really incredibly important um and i really value new ideas and people that are really trying to build positive futures so yeah Krása, krásná tečka. My vám, Sáro, moc děkujeme za vaši přednášku, za spoustu vašich inspirativních myšlenek. Já myslím, že inspirací máme teď plnou hlavu a budeme chtít být všichni kreativní a inspirovat se všude kolem. Takže já ještě jednou moc děkuji Sáře Emery Volker za její slova, za její přednášku. Děkuji moc vám, divákům, děkuji za ty otázky, děkuji za pozornost, divákům a divačkám, pardon. Děkuji moc za pozornost. Všichni se s váma loučíme. Já jsem Lenka Vrtišková, Lebová, budu se s váma těšit někdy příště a má vám i nakam nahoru do vzdálených galaxií, kam jsme právě vyskali vzkaz. A jen tu mám ještě malé, malé pozvání na zítřek. Zítra v inspiračním fóru bude téma voda. A ještě jednou moc děkuju, Sáro, mějte se krásně a děkujeme. Nasledanou. Thank you.